Previously, we delved into the elusive mysteries of travel restrictions to Antarctica. Imagine a continent as vast as North America, but nearly all of it is forbidden to travelers, except for a select few areas on strictly guided tours. If you stray from these routes, well, military intervention might await. Online sources like Quora or Wikipedia assure that anyone can travel to Antarctica anytime, brushing aside any concerns as paranoia. Yet, the reality diverges sharply. Independent explorers like adventurer Jarl Anhoy have been met with hostility, even arrest for attempting to explore Antarctica freely. This contradiction between online truths and real-life restrictions raises eyebrows. Why prevent access if there's supposedly nothing to see? Antarctica, theoretically neutral and requiring no visas, still demands permissions that only tour operators typically arrange. Questions linger. Why restrict access so intensely? Are claims of protecting the environment the full story? Or could there be more beyond Antarctica's icy surface? Anyway, this is part two of the series. If you feel like you've missed anything, check out the previous video. The link is in the description. I recommend watching it to get the full picture. So, without further ado, fasten your pants and let's get started. We have gone from anyone can travel to Antarctica at any time to travel to Antarctica is highly restricted and requires government permission which is not granted unless you are part of a tour. And what is that tour like? You reach the outermost tip of Antarctica, take a few photos of penguins and return home. But if you type in who owns Antarctica on Google, you get this answer. This doesn't make sense. If Antarctica doesn't belong to anyone, then there is nobody who can restrict me from going there. If a piece of land belongs to nobody, anyone can stand, walk and sit there. That's why Google also says this. If Antarctica belongs to no one, then who is doing the banning? You don't have to study law to understand that if there is no proprietor, then there is no person who has jurisdiction there. If I mustn't take anything man-made to Antarctica, that's the same as saying I can't be there at all. If I cannot take my camping or cooking gear, how can I survive? Imagine the absurdity it's no problem at all. Anyone can travel there. Just don't take any clothing, food, tent, snow boots, hat, scarf, anything really. Anything you take, it's banned. Let's also consider this. The Marshall Service became the official law enforcement entity for the South Pole through an agreement with the National Science Foundation, NSF, and the U.S. Attorney for Hawaii. In 1989, the NSF approached the Marshal for the District of Hawaii to assist in setting up a legal presence in Antarctica. So let me get this straight. The continent belongs to nobody and there is nothing there, but the U.S. Marshal Service is the official law enforcement? How bizarre. The Marshal Service was established to work for courts. Their responsibilities include accompanying fugitives and prisoners and managing the assets of criminals. Why would there be marshals to enforce law in a wasteland of ice and snow? Antarctica is not a prison, is it? Google and Wikipedia claim Antarctica is a military-free continent, and so made since 1959. Considering all sources saying there's no military in Antarctica, it's strange to find an equal amount of sources telling me that there is. So here we go from there's no military there to uh, sure, there is, but only for infrastructure services. One travel website says you are allowed to travel to the Antarctica, but you are not allowed to bring motorized vehicles, planes, boats, or dogs. That's for environmental protection. In other words, feel free to swim to the Antarctica. But once you are there, you can't venture very far because you can't even bring dogs to pull a sled, much less a snowmobile. My point is, the military is allowed to bring these things. If they are so concerned about environmental protection, then there wouldn't be those strange daily cargo flights to Antarctica. If military is only there for infrastructure services, not for defense and combat according to the Antarctic Treaty, then how did this happen? US secretly launched three nuclear rockets from Antarctica to test EMP on Russia. 
The U.S. government ran a series of nuclear tests over the South Atlantic Ocean to test an electromagnetic pulse in space, a documentary revealed. Operation Argus was a series of high-atmosphere nuclear weapons tests conducted between August and September 1958 over the South Atlantic Ocean. The whole project, which was highly classified, took just 11 days and was carried out by the Defense Nuclear Agency during the Cold War period. It was proposed by scientist Nicholas Christophilos as a means to verify whether the high-altitude nuclear detonations would create a radiation belt in the extreme upper regions of the Earth's atmosphere. However, many believe the real intent was much more sinister. Aaron and Melissa Dykes put forward an alternative theory during their YouTube documentary, The Real Secrets Hidden in Antarctica. They argue the U.S. government was actually testing whether the electromagnetic pulse created by a nuclear explosion could be used as a weapon in the event of World War III with Russia. Ms. Dykes revealed, In 1963, there were claims made that a nuclear bomb had been detonated on Antarctica. Although the U.S. initially denied reports, trying to pass it off as a natural phenomenon, they later admitted it had actually happened. They may have set this off in the upper atmosphere of the South Pole in order to create an artificial EMP. If they did, it would have been allowed under the Antarctica Treaty if it was deemed to be for scientific purposes. Just yesterday, more details on a secret Pentagon project below the ice was revealed. Declassified files showed the well-publicized Camp Century of the 1960s was actually a cover-up for a top-secret program. Project Iceworm was the code name for the United States Army's mission to build a network of mobile nuclear missile launch sites in Greenland. The ultimate objective was to place medium-range missiles under the ice, close enough to strike targets within the Soviet Union. However, just three years after it was built, Ice core samples taken by geologists demonstrated that the glacier was moving much faster than anticipated and would destroy the tunnels and planned launch stations in about two years. The facility was evacuated in 1965 and the nuclear generator removed. A more recent article. Chinese reportedly alarmed over Antarctic battle, but experts say new U.S. base doesn't exist. Would the Chinese be alarmed over something that doesn't exist? I doubt it. On a website about Pakistani military defense, of all places, there is a video about a fishing boat riding the seas north of Antarctica being intercepted by a warship of the Australian Navy. The crew of the fishing boat filmed the whole event. The warship destroyer HMAS Hobart intercepted a fishing boat that claimed to be an unrestricted area south of Tasmania. I cite this story as one of many examples of ships patrolling the region. From a brief search of the internet, I have learned that you can travel to the Antarctic and you can't. It is owned by nobody, but it is owned by somebody. There is no military, but there is. The military isn't there for defense, but it is. It doesn't take a detective to get suspicious by now. These things cannot be true simultaneously. Anyway. This was an excerpt from the book Mysteries of the Arctic and Antarctic by Frederick Dodson. Knowledge dissemination relies on you. Share this article far and wide.